Hello. Welcome back. I'm Jake Fowler, and I'll be your host for the Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. This is the Ecumenical Councils, Part 15. There's been a lot of controversy these last two weeks in the church. We've had, oh gosh, lots to talk about, and I'm not going to discuss any of it. I don't really care that much. Well, that's not true. I care a little bit insofar as it affects me and my peers and the church at large. But I really just want to talk about history. I want to talk about theology. I think that's more important, honestly, than the minutia of the day-to-day news feed, the crisis, right? Some people say, what crisis? Define the crisis. Show me what crisis in the church. Are you blind? Look around. At the same time, don't think that there wasn't one before. There was one before Vatican II. There was one before Vatican I and Trent and so on and so forth. And that's where I like to live. I like to live in history, right? My wife likes to tease me. She says I'm an old soul. When we met, I was 21, maybe. Might have been 20. And she thought, man, this guy acts like he's 50. Well, now I'm a little bit older, and I must be even older than 50 in my soul. I don't know. We'll see. I'll tell you what, though. I enjoy talking about the ecumenical councils. I like dealing with the controversies that have gone before. Primarily, well, they're interesting. There's a lot of murder and intrigue. There's backstabbing. There's papal mishaps, there's imperial mishaps, there's just everything. But for me, and I hope for you, what it boils down to is this. The church has been through it. The church has been through it and will continue to go through it day in and day out. And that shouldn't shake our faith. Don't leave and become a sede vacantis. Don't leave and become an Eastern Orthodox. Certainly don't leave and become a Protestant. That's the least understandable of all those positions. But don't leave. That's the thing. We're in a crisis. So what? We've always been. So let's pick back up where we were. I think I left you in the early 680s. Let me turn down my jam. There we go. Sip a martini. Hmm. All right, that's enough by way of introduction. Let's get to the heart of it. Leo II, in 682, had circulated the, uh, the documents or, or the final acta of Constantinople III with his clarification about Pope Honorius to all the Western bishops, and they signed on. So we have papal approval, we have acceptance by the West, we had a prior acceptance by the East, and so, therefore, we concluded last time in part 14 that Constantinople III is rightly the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Moving forward, in 685, the emperor died This was Constantine IV. He left the empire to his son, Justinian II. Justinian had large aspirations. He had grand visions, just like Justinian I did. He wanted to be just like his namesake. Remember, Justinian I was one of the greatest emperors that Rome had. He wasn't always on the right side theologically, although he was probably personally orthodox. Some of his policies were simply boneheaded. Nonetheless, he reigned for something like 38 years. He reformed the civil law code. He saw the church through Constantinople II, and all of its attendant controversies. And Justinian II, now reflecting back 130-something years, looks at Justinian I's legacy and wants to emulate that very much, even to the point of forcing his wife, who was not a Roman, to take the name Theodora. She was a Khazar. More on that in a moment. Uh, Justinian the second, he wanted to reform canon law. 
He thought that would be the way to leave his mark on history. The first had reformed the civil law, Justinian Code. So the second wanted to leave his imprint on ecclesiastical law. And to do this, he summoned another council. It had only been 11 years since Constantinople III, so it's a bit premature. And there really hasn't been a new heresy that requires condemnation. Nothing that I'm aware of anyways. This council, however, was meant to be mostly disciplinary in nature. In fact, almost exclusively. It would pick up where the fifth and Sixth Councils left off. Those two didn't deal with disciplinary matters as much as, let's say, Chalcedon or even Nicaea I. So it's kind of not really the Fifth Council, and it's not really the Sixth Council, but it's sort of taking up where those two didn't address problems in the church uh, as far as discipline goes. And so this particular council in the year 692 is called Quinisext. So it's like the fifth and sixth. It's also called the Council in Trullo, so named because it was held in a portion of the imperial palace called the Trullus, which I think uh, means something like dome or shell. I didn't look that up. My apologies. Nonetheless, uh, let's see. Oh, what does my notes say? Great domed room at the palace called the Trullus. So there you have it. Council in Trullo or the Quinisext Council of 692, summoned by Justinian II. This council, however, met without the approval of the Pope. There was no participation by any Western bishops save that of the legates in Constantinople. They were the permanent residents there. They were like the apostolic delegation, the nuncios, if you will. They were there, but aside from that, No other Western bishops were present. So this is an overwhelmingly Eastern affair, much like Constantinople I. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. But right off the bat, we shouldn't just throw this one out because only Eastern bishops were present. Because if we did that, then we'd have to do the same for the First Council of Constantinople. 211 of these Eastern bishops were there. They met, they discussed these canonical matters. Among the topics were married clergy, the Lenten fast, including Saturdays, and they took up once more the content of Canon 28 from the Council of Chalcedon. If you're just joining this series, or if for some reason you don't memorize my every word, Canon 28 is the one that says that Rome and Constantinople share in the primacy in the church. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it boils down to. Equal in honor, equal in power, except Rome has more honor. Something like that. It's a little strange if you read the text of it. It's like, what does this mean? And what what are they getting at here? It's basically an attempt, right? The Catholic Church sees this as an attempt to elevate Constantinople to the level of Rome while paying lip service to Rome. Not great. Nonetheless, they talked about it. They talked about clergy. I said that. Married priests and deacons, according to the Quinisext Council of 692, are now allowed to live with their wives. In the West, this wasn't typically how it went. The married clergy were required to be continent. Married clergy were sort of fading out in the West. There was some. It wasn't entirely uncommon. But celibacy was the norm in the Western church. And for those who were married and also ordained, continents, uh, in other words, refraining from marital relations, that was expected. And oftentimes, these clergymen didn't live with their wives, right? That would be above scandal. They, they would be, in, in some way, above reproach, okay? Because you could say, well, I don't even stay the night there. 
So I'm above suspicion. But now, according to the canons of this new council, that changed. You can, you can live with your wife and, in fact, enjoy the fruits of marriage. Among the other topics, I mentioned the Lenten fast. Lent during weekdays, they said no mass should be allowed when you're fasting, only a communion service. Again, not a Western practice. It was an Eastern practice. It may still be, in fact, an Eastern practice. But it wasn't popular in the Roman Rite to do that. Moreover, this council prohibited fasting on Saturday. Now, it's my understanding, I'm open to being corrected here, but it's my understanding that the reason the East does not fast on Saturdays during Lent is in order to honor what was formerly the Sabbath day. Fair enough. But again, this is not the practice in the West. It wasn't then and it isn't now. We fast on Saturdays during Lent. Sunday is the only day we break from fasting. I have to wonder, now my sources didn't explicitly say this, but I was thinking about it after the fact. If you can't fast on Saturday, doesn't that change the either the date of Ash Wednesday or the date of Easter? Because if you need 40 days of fasting to make Lent, and you're taking your fasting week from six days down to five days, it would seem now you need eight weeks of Lent. And I believe that is currently the practice for many Eastern Christians. But again, that's not the Roman custom. You should be sensing a pattern here. Maybe there's a theme, almost as if Justinian II wants to impose upon the Western Church all sorts of Eastern customs and disciplines that really don't belong. There's nothing wrong with them. Honestly, I, I think it's great that we have such diversity in custom in the church between East and West. But to try to force the one onto the other, I mean, this is like the Latinizations that people decry all the time. So when it happens in the other direction, when it's the East imposing upon the West, we, we should decry it. And in fact, they did back then. Last but not least among the controversial topics is Canon 28, which I previously described, and it was approved again. Hmm. The ambassadors, the papal legates living in Constantinople, these, this is not a papal delegation sent specifically to the council. These are, like I said, the nuncios, the, the ambassadors. That's, that's the best word for them. They signed the document, and they believed that Pope Sergius would also. Sergius, a Syrian pope who was actually born in Italy to Syrian parents, he is reigning on the throne of Peter since the year 687, so he's five years into his pontificate, and he receives word that there's been this Eastern Council. 211 Eastern bishops and his ambassadors have signed the canons. There were 102 canons produced. Everybody signed them. They sent them to him for approval, thinking, well, surely the legates signed, the Pope will sign, and if the Pope signs, all the Western bishops will sign, and this will be another ecumenical council. And all these canons will be approved, and the church will be in harmony, and Justinian II will have left his mark on history, reforming canon law. But Sergius says, nah. Especially regarding the three topics I mentioned, the married clergy, the Lenten fast, and canon 28. He says, no, we're not doing that here, right? He didn't say it like that. Well, he may have probably said it in Latin. But in other words, he rejects it. And so the West never really accepted the Quinisex Council as such. Justinian II is, 
how do we say it, angry? And what do angry emperors normally do? They try to kidnap the Pope. He sent people to arrest Sergius. Justinian's agent, a man named Zachary, he arrives with some size of a force, but he sort of underestimates the people of Rome. He finds in them a people willing to die for the Holy Father. They turned on him. Zachary, I believe, was an exarch of some sort. I'm a little fuzzy. It's been a few weeks since I've read this, so forgive me. He wasn't unfamiliar with the Italian people. He thought he would have their support. If the emperor says it, the Romans will surely do it. He, he was wrong. He was dead wrong. And when he realized that they will straight up kill him rather than betray Pope Sergius, he tries to flee. And the safest place he can think of to flee is the Lateran Palace. And not just the Lateran Palace, but the very bedchamber of Pope Sergius. One of my sources said that he read, he, he, excuse me, I read in one of my sources that Zachary hid in the Pope's bed, and another source said that he hid under the Pope's bed, whichever it is. It's remarkably embarrassing to be documented throughout all time now that you're the guy that came to arrest the Pope, and because the Romans resisted, you chickened out, and you went back to this same Pope and begged for him to hide you, and you sought refuge under his bed, like you're hiding from the monsters or something like that. Uh, Sergius protected the poor man. He persuaded the Romans not to hurt him. And he sent the man back to Constantinople unharmed. Justinian II, clearly not pleased. He's angered again. But before he could really do anything else in attempt to seek revenge on Pope Sergius, he's deposed. A usurper, Leontius, Leontius gains the throne, and according to Byzantine custom, he has Justinian II's face mutilated. This was a tactic used in the Byzantine world to prevent individuals from holding office. If you weren't intact, you couldn't be a public official. It was against the law for disfigured people to do otherwise. So, Leontius had Justinian II's nose cut off, and his tongue was damaged, and then he was exiled. Let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is an artist's rendition of what Justinian II may have looked like. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Yeah, there we go. So I'm not sure how accurate the facial expression will be or his, or his facial structure, but you can see the golden nose that he had fashioned for himself strapped on his face because his nose was gone. All right. Goodbye, Your Highness. Where was I? Yes, Justinian II sent off to exile, Leontius, now ruling as Roman emperor, and this is in the year 695. 695. Leontius was not a strong ruler. He really didn't know what he was getting into. He wasn't a good administrator. I think he just envied the lifestyles of the rich and famous sort of thing. He wanted all of the wine and uh, whatever hot dogs they were serving back then in Byzantium. And he's just unsuccessful as emperor with the assistance of a neighboring kingdom, specifically the Bulgars. Justinian 
regains the throne. He unseats Leontius 10 years later in 705. In between then and then being 695 and 705, Justinian meets this Khazar girl and he persuades her to marry him. And, oh, by the way, you need to change your name to Theodora because I'm Justinian, Justinian Theodora. You know, it's kind of a legacy thing from back then. Well, she's okay with it, apparently, or, or she didn't know what he was saying because she speaks another language. Long story short, Justinian and Theodora come back, regain the throne in Constantinople in 705, and they take their revenge out on Leontius. Leontius is blinded. And then, curiously, sent back to Rome. This is possibly, and I'm inclined to agree, that this is possibly a message to the Pope. Sergius is dead. However, his successor, John VII, he still hasn't done anything about these quinisext canons, these 102 canons from the council in 692. And Justinian really wants these to be accepted by the Western Church so that he can leave his legacy on the Roman Empire. So it's reasonable, I think, to conclude that sending this poor man who's now been blinded to Rome, to Pope John VII, is sort of like a warning. Now, John died before answering the emperor's message. And the next pope, he's got a great name, by the way, the next pope, Constantine. Constantine, <clears throat> excuse me, he's also not really big on these quintessext canons. Constantine was also a Syrian, just like Sergius was. And in 708, he makes a very unlikely journey. He travels to Constantinople. This is a guy, he had been there before. He probably had a lot of connections. You see, he was one of the legates at Constantinople three in 680 and 681. He was sent by Agatho to be part of the delegation to hammer out uh, and, and to hammer, I should say, the monothelite heresy. Constantine was no stranger to imperial affairs. He spent months in the capital. And now he's going back as pope. He's an older man now, granted. It's almost 30 years later. And he's described as exceedingly gentle, but that doesn't mean he's not firm. Constantine goes to Constantinople. He seeks an audience with Justinian II. And it seemed to go really well. Although the proceedings are mysterious to us, I don't believe they've come down to us in any form. The result sort of speaks for itself. The Quintessext canons are not to be applied in the West. So the practice of allowing East and West to each have their own customs and disciplines is left intact. This is a good thing for several reasons. Number one, the ability of Western bishops to dispose of their own affairs according to their own customs is a very helpful thing. Married clergy, like I mentioned before, although not uncommon, were subject to different expectations in the West than the East, and trying to force an Eastern mentality onto Western clergy is illegitimate. It's not fair. It's not prudent, etc., etc. And the liturgical practices, specifically surrounding Lent, Again, these are a matter of ancient discipline stemming from the way the Roman rite and the Byzantine rite and the other uh, liturgical rites grew and developed over time. So to come in 
and to impose from the top down is not a great idea. We can say, I think, rather securely that if the West had attempted to do this to the East, it would have been viewed as intolerable. It would have been just as illegitimate, right? In fact, it, it happened. And we'll get to that probably months from now when we're talking about Pius X and other things that the Western Church attempted to impose on Eastern Rite Catholics. Nonetheless, for now, in 708, excuse me, about 710, for now, the matter is settled and the church is at peace. Thanks be to God. And it lasted about a year. In 711, Justinian II is deposed again, this time for good, because he and his whole family were massacred by the usurper, Philippicus. Philippicus was an Armenian general. He was a monothelite at heart. He wanted to restore the monothelite heresy. Well, he didn't think it was a heresy. He wanted to restore what he believed was pristine Christian doctrine. And he did so in several ways. Number one, he symbolically refused to enter the imperial palace until a commemorative plaque of Constantinople III was removed. He deposed the Patriarch of Constantinople, who was Orthodox. He ordered the teaching of monothelitism in all theological schools. He burned, right? This makes me just, uh, angers me very much. He burned the original copies of the Acts of Constantinople II from 553. He restored all of the deposed or heretical bishops from 681 onward to the diptychs. In other words, he put their names back into the liturgy in defiance of the last council. Last but not least, very generous, he sent a gift to Pope Constantine. He sent the head of Justinian II. Naturally, Pope Constantine did not accept these generous gifts and gestures. He did not turn from the apostolic faith to this worn-out heresy. If you recall, and I don't want to get into the weeds here on this, but just briefly, monothelitism is the doctrine that there is one will in Christ. It's basically an extension of monophysitism, that there's one nature in Christ, which we, it, it's a corruption and a bastardization of what Cyril, St. Cyril of Alexandria taught in the first half of the fifth century. Philippicus, this usurping emperor, he thinks this is just awesome. And he did all of that stuff. And he's like, oh, by the way, mail the Pope this severed head. It'll be so cool. Constantine is like, no, thanks. Philippicus is a forceful emperor, right? He's very firm. He's very strong-willed. Look at all these things that he's done. But he himself is another inept ruler. He reminds me of another Leontius. Just can't hang on to the throne, doesn't really know how to run things. He lost his position, and he too was blinded. The man who took his place is named Anastasius II. Anastasius is orthodox, and he attempted to right the ship, but his reign didn't go anywhere either. He's unseated in 715, and replaced by a man named Theodosius. Theodosius was a tax collector of some, of some sort. He worked for the imperial government. He really didn't 
want to be emperor? He kind of gave signs of saying like, oh, I guess I'll take the job. Is there anybody else? Are you sure? Couldn't we get Anastasius back? This is awkward. All right, I'll do it. Fine. And shouldn't be much of a surprise. He didn't last long either. In 717, Theodosius is unseated. So we've gone from Justinian II to Leontius, back to Justinian II to Philippicus, to Anastasius, to Theodosius, and now to Leo, Leo III, the Isaurian which is a curious epithet because he is not actually from Isauria. Let's see, I have another graphic here. Let's see if I can get this thing pulled up. Oh, yeah, there we go. Cover up my face for a moment, give you all a little break. Isauria, if you can make out Asia Minor, right, modern-day Turkey, you can see Italy a little bit to the right. You can see Greece. A little more to the right across the Aegean Sea, you can see what is now Turkey. And sort of in that first cluster of purple, it's hard for me because I can't point at it to show you where it is. Maybe I could just resize this. Stand by. Yes. Okay, that's a little better. No, it's still not helping. Well, long story short, roughly southwest central-ish Asia Minor. That's about where Isauria is. But Leo's not from there. He's from northern Syria, so I don't know why we went through all that. Nonetheless, that was a pretty firm Monophysite territory. By all accounts, however, Leo's a Chalcedonian, but he's sort of immersed in this cultural milieu, right? And, and if you think about his heritage is Syrian, which is now dominated by the Mohammedans. And he's growing up in this area and he's coming about in a time where there's great controversy. There's a lot of upheaval. We've got emperor after emperor, they're deposing each other, they're cutting off their other noses, and you're blinded, and they chop your head off and send it to the Pope, and it's a mess. Not to mention, Leo inherits a siege. Right as he takes the throne, almost immediately he's faced with a large-scale Mohammedan invasion and they siege Constantinople for over a year. Now, Leo III is unlike his immediate predecessors. He is a strong ruler. He does know how to run things. And he successfully repels the siege over a long period of time through attrition of the Mohammedan warships that are sort of camped outside of Constantinople, right there in the Mediterranean. He defeats it. The siege is broken. Constantinople is preserved, right? Weakened, but preserved. This victory, however uh, pathetic or embarrassing it may have been at the time, wins him enough favor to ensure that his imperial tenure is somewhat more than about 24 months. In fact, Leo III reigns for 23 years. Put that in perspective. Five emperors had come and gone in the last 10 years and seven in the last two decades. And Leo himself is going to reign for over two decades. He must have been doing something right. Leo's achievements, nothing to scoff at. First to be mentioned among these are his updating and revising of Justinian Code. The curious combination, so says Father Leo Davis, 
of Christian values and savagery are blended quite nicely. It reflects accurately the zeitgeist or the, the spirit of the times present in Eastern Roman Empire at this time. So we have such things as furthering the rights of women and children. That's good. We should thank Leo III for that. Strengthening the bonds of marriage. That's very good. He enshrined these sort of things in law. Thank you, Leo III. Not so good on the not so good side. Mutilation is now authorized as a criminal punishment. The consolidation of all power into the person of the emperor. That's point two. The two swords doctrine. Hmm, Leo III doesn't much on that. It kind of goes out the window. So that's really not so good. So on the one hand, we have protecting the women and children, strengthening the bonds of marriage. On the other hand, we have more nose cuttings, right? More tongue disfigurations. And then we have the further centralization of power in the man, the emperor. Oh, crying baby. Sorry if you can hear that. She'll get over it. Mm. Leo's defeat of the Mohammedans and the threats from the Bulgars and the Slavs, right? These, these two peoples, well, these three peoples, really, the Mohammedans are pressing in on the Eastern Roman Empire from the south. The Bulgars and the Slavs from the west. And Leo wants to consolidate religion. When he's finally freed of military conflict in about the year 726, he has this epiphany. I guess you could call it that. Oh, has that been there the whole time? Awkward. Leo in 726 has this epiphany. He says, you know, uh, some things are dawning on me. Maybe we're losing all of these battles. Maybe the Bulgars and the Slavs and the Mohammedans, and we've got this internal strife and emperor after emperor because we're angering God. We're angering God. We are worshiping images. We're bowing down to statues. We're praying to paintings. This is not good, so says Leo. Particularly pernicious are images of our Lord. Why? Why would he think this? Well, he says, on the one hand, if you say you're representing only the human nature, then it sounds like you're a Nestorian because you've divided Christ into two. And if you say you're depicting both natures in this statue or painting or icon, well, it sort of sounds like you're circumscribing the divine, which is impossible. So it's Leo's opinion that images, whichever way you cut it, they got to go. I'm describing iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, the destruction of images. Christians ought not use them, so say the iconoclasts. It's blasphemous. It's idolatrous. And they must be destroyed. As I mentioned, Leo grew up in an environment surrounded by a suspicion of images. He was Syrian, right? Despite his name, the Asaurian, he's from northern Syria, a town I think is named Germanicus or something like that. This is one of 
the hot spots for the Paulicians and the Monophysites, who each, for their own reason, oppose images. And this may also be a reaction, right? Some speculate, and I'm inclined to agree, that Leo's disposition regarding images is a reaction of an Oriental man imbued with Oriental culture to certain errant strands in Hellenism. What do I mean by that? The cult of beauty of the human form embraced by the Greeks, the Hellenic culture, was somewhat repugnant to those of the Orient. And I don't mean Orient in the way we use it now, which would be like the Far East, China, Japan, etc. The Orient in this time period refers to the East of the Empire or what was the empire. So what we would now call the Middle East, that was the Orient, okay, roughly. Orientals didn't always appreciate Greek ideas. Leo being an Oriental may not have appreciated the Greek appreciation for the human form. And so again, faced with the military disasters, the internal strife. It's logical, sort of. It's understandable. Let me put it that way. It's understandable how Leo would arrive at this conclusion that images are bad. Regardless, whatever it was at the root of all this, the opposition in the form of iconoclasm was very strong. They didn't like idolatry. That's good. Nobody should like idolatry. But they seemed to take it a little too far. I think that's good. I think I should go and check on that crying baby. Check on my poor wife who's handling the crying baby. Oh, and there she is across the room. Hello, dears. All right, so that'll be that then. We've made it from 682 or 683 to somewhere in the neighborhood of 626, 726, excuse me, or 727. This is the time where I switch the scene. Ah, closing music. It's hot in here. I'm a little sweaty. I need to drink this faster. Mmm. Please, please tune in again for part 16 of the Ecumenical Councils. But in the meantime, check this out. This little blue square you see on your screen, it's got a funny name in the middle. Our Lady's Closet. Our Lady's Closet is a brand new, I mean just days old, just days old. It's a clothing company. They, they specialize in making Catholic attire, modest, simple, elegant, durable, Catholic attire, dresses and skirts for young ladies. And they, at Our Lady's Closet, is none other than my bride. Some people have asked me, Jake, where's your Patreon? How can I support you? And normally I say, go support Tim Flanders, go support Jeremiah. Go support Kennedy and Luis. And I still mean all that. Please do that because they're the ones that keep me on the air. But if you want to support me, you can go to Etsy.com and find Our Lady's Closet. And you could support my wife. And that will be supporting me. All right. Until next time, which I hope will be Tuesday. Never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori.